Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is going to be another Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro Duel video, another competitively oriented set of games, this time playing with Mermails again, a very similar list to what I played in the previous video, only with one minor change, and that is the two Salvages instead of the two Aqua Spirits. This was something that I've been wanting to test. I finally pulled the trigger on going to test it, because basically the cards fill pretty similar roles in the current form of the deck. Aqua Spirit being a level 4 water that you could special summon for free used to be a lot more relevant in the pre-Master Rule 4 era pre-Link era where like you were able to make Bahamut sharks and toads and all that sort of stuff and now it is still very valuable because it is a free monster you can summon from your hand but its main value in the current form of Mermails is with its graveyard manipulation of getting different cards out of your graveyard getting you closer to later stage Mulan Glacia drops or just you know getting you closer to certain uh, just things usually they revolve around Mulan Glace what you're trying to be doing uh, rather than having to drop Mulan Glace early and then link away with it it's a much more conducive strat for you to be able to salvage later in the combo sequence and then be able to drop Moulin Glace and leave it on the field after you're done comboing for the most part. As well as salvage also just lends itself very well to the rest of the deck because it gives you extra cards in hand when you are doing your Gumblar discard, uh, discards and stuff. So sometimes that comes up. But basically, the card is very live uh, most of the time because you have Neptibus, which is a target. You've got the Gun, the Lind, the Undines, all the Atlanteans, and the Nimbles and stuff. So the card is very very rarely dead and it's a card that similarly to aqua spirit is only really good and live even if you are actively playing the game so it was something that i wanted to test and i have been testing it as of the past couple of days and i've actually been really liking it but anyway this gameplay video is going to be with mermails against altergeists another competitively oriented meta matchup just to see how this deck plays against a sample size of some games against altergeists uh just to give you guys an idea of how a variant of Mermel like this that is not a Light of Sekka build would do against a deck like Altergeist. For those of you that keep continuously asking, I'm not a fan of Light of Sekka Mermails. I think they are some of the worst things I've ever seen and or played. Uh, they don't really have that much staying power. They're less consistent overall because you lose out on good power cards as well as consistency cards. And again, Salvage falls into another one of those power card things that's you know really good that you get to play because you're not playing Light of Sekka, all that sort of stuff. So I much prefer these builds because I think that these builds have a much better chance of not shitting themselves in a larger round tournament event. So that's just something uh, to consider. But anyway, I'm going to stop uh, babbling on here and let's just jump straight into the first of several games with this deck playing against Altergeists. All right, so going into the first game, I get to start. First game, first match. I, I typically just start these. I don't know why. I'm just really good at rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> I guess, when it comes to these. Um, of just like picking the right one. But anyway, I get to open with Moray of Greed, which resets my hand. I open Undyne and a Megalo drop. I get to drop Moulin Glace, but my opponent has impermanence for it, so that means that, I mean, the Moulin Glace still took a card out of their hand, and it was a trap, so I mean, that's good, but could have been better. Now, you'll see my opponent has a Cherries in his hand. Uh, he does not have any valid target against my deck in his extra deck. His Cherries targets are very specific and pinpointed. He does have a Totally Awesome in his extra deck, which in theory would be a target against Mermails, but Mermail doesn't play like Toad deck anymore. Like, you don't just spam out Totally Awesomes anymore with this deck, uh, which means that the deck has just evolved past that. Uh, he doesn't play any Summon Sorceress or Firewall Dragon as Cherry's targets. He plays, like, Double Helix, Is Sold, like, all of the cards that he would want to hit that are the specific starter cards for the other decks in the format, like Kagari and Shizuku's and all that sort of stuff. He plays all of those for his Cherry's targets, does not have room for a Summon Sorceress in there with all the stuff that he wants to play for his own strat as well. So it might be something that he might want to consider putting in, though, because Summon Sorceress is a lot more of a universal hit against Rogue decks and Rogue strategies like my deck is. But so I'm not capable of attacking this turn because I used the Moulin Glace the previous turn and linked away with it, so my battle phase is skipped. But I did get rid of my board into Trigate just so that I could banish that Mellow Seek so it's not just on the field. I definitely just wanted that card gone. <laughs> I keep trying to take cards out of his hand with the um, with the Gumblar, but he drew into Ash, which he was able to Ash my Sphere, so that, that didn't happen. And then he drew into uh, Infinite Impermanence to Impermanence the Gumblar when I tried to bring back Link Karibo off tributing Neptibus. So like, uh, it was one of those things where like just getting the perfect cards off the top of his deck two turns in a row to at least be able to still play the game. But even though like he's still able to try and play the game, his cards that he has access to are not 
in a good enough quality and quantity to to play through the board considering you know what's going on and what's been happening during my entire my entire turn structures really because I started with such a huge oppressive board extra linking and then gum blowing two cards out of his hand while he was already down a card because of the impermanence uh, it was just one of those things and then technically down another card because of the uh, cherries but like he just discarded that because it was dead off of the first gum blar. Uh, it was just one of those things that uh, that it wasn't really a salvageable game for him. But so, this game, he did not think that he needed to bounce my Neptibus on summon with Silquidus. Uh, it was very interesting. We went into a sided game, he sided in rivalries and stuff. Um, I have the Twin Twister, so he just flips rivalry to trigger his multi-faker. And he just decides not to... Either he didn't have his toggle on at this point in time, or he just decided he didn't need... To bounce the Neptibus, and he's like, I'll just wait until he gets more resources involved into the play, and then I'll bounce. But I was able to put a heavy infantry into the play sequence to bait his Silquidus by targeting it, and he bounced my Megalo to hand because that's the most resource intense uh, intensive card that was on my field. But I'm just able to play Salvage and get my cards back <laughs> and just drop the Megalo again, and then OTK him. So a 2 0 match in my favor. Next match, he wins Rock, Paper, Scissors. He gets to start. Starts with Meloseek into Link Karibo. I just Ash the Meloseek effect because I don't want to have to deal with like Ash not being able to work with any protocols or anything like that that could be coming up later. And he flips a Manifestation, I call by the Grave the Meloseek, he chains spoofing on the Manifestation to put the Manifestation back into the deck, add uh, Multifaker, Specialist Multifaker, and now at this point his toggle is permanently on. He has always chain clicked permanently. And I know this for a fact because for the rest of the entirety of these matches that we played, every single action that I took or that he took gave him a response window for him to click on so he just put always chain on and he just left that bitch on he was just like I'm I'm gonna sick I'm gonna silk with this that thing every single time it gets normal summoned he definitely just learned straight up to just always leave always chain on at least either he decided to not actively bounce the Neptibus during the last game or he just didn't press a quick enough so he just put always chain on it was like nope we're just uh we're just not gonna have this be a problem ever again but so my hand is kind of unfortunate because if I had any way to like play through the one Silquidus then I could potentially start doing stuff into the game like if I had any Megalos or Chaoses or things like that this is a game one so there's no sided cards like Twin Twister and stuff in but if I had just opened a bit of a more mermaid-y hand, rather than just opening a bunch of, like, starter cards with no discard outlets or anything like that, I could have at least tried to play into this board a bit better. But because I just only have Divas and Neptibuses and cards that work with discarding, I'm just not really capable of getting going. And the Silquidus is pretty much the card that just... the one-of card that just ends my entire game plan for the remainder of the game. But So, next game, I get to go first. Sided game. Even when I go first against Altergeist, I do keep red reboots in my deck. I side those in and I put them in going first as well because I don't want to get impermanence multi-fakered. <laughs> so I just put the red reboots in. But so from here, I actually messed up. This soul charge play was supposed to be a lot more powerful than it actually was. I had to either put the Megalo in the zone under the Reproducus or summon the Moulin Glace there. And I just blanked on both accounts. Um, it's still a good play by no stretch of the by like any stretch of the imagination. It's still a, a fantastic play, even though I did open Ibly, I give it to my opponent off the Summon Sorceress, Unicorn it back into my deck, and then Mermaid it back out. It's still a fine play, but it's just it could have been better, and I could have used that Soul Charge later had I just put the Moulin Glace, for example, under the Reaper Dacus, which is where it usually always goes. I have no idea why I blanked and put it off to the side. I feel like I subconsciously did that because I saw the Soul Charge and I was like, well, I can just put this here and keep it, but that's not the case at all. Like, I had to burn the Soul Charge and, like, still get rid of the Moulin Glace. Uh, so, like, that was a huge problem. But, I mean, like, I'm still capable of doing an entire play, so, I mean, that's fine. Uh, my opponent forgot that uh, him keeping those cards in hand is just going to mean that I Gumblar him, even though he couldn't get rid of the Droll, obviously. He could have still, like, set the Multifaker, but, like, <laughs> you're still taking 3k. I guess he just realized, I guess maybe he just thought, well, it's going away anyway, but, I mean, setting Multifaker would have been something to keep on the board for, like, future turns, because I don't have a Battle Phase during my next turn because of Moulin Glacia. Uh, but, still, it was one of those things where he can't really come back from it. Uh, he can't come back from it at all because of the fact that I have, uh, I have opened as strongly as I did, but so now, here's another one of those games. Uh, I want to just like make some sort of joke and say like time to strap on the helmet, but like Altergeist is actually just a really interactive deck with how its monsters work. 
So it's not even really like, you can definitely tell the difference between good Altergeist players and bad, 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 bad Altergeist players that do literally just strap on the helmet. Like, if I was playing against a subpar Altergeist player right now, I would have like infinite turns to like do things, but he's able to just keep pressuring me and he's stepping up his monsters into Hextia. He's resolving Multifaker on every one of his turns and on every one of my turns to step up into bigger monsters and stuff, and he's just moving things around, and he's burning cards on specific things, like he impermanenced my Neptibus, even though knowing full well he was just gonna bounce it with, Sil uh, with Silky. So like, even like, he's willing to take those minus one trades to just make sure that I just can't play at all. But so, this was a little brain fart moment for me. I just completely forgot that the rivalry was up. <laughs> even I twin twisted on the rivalry and the manifestation, right? Discarding the uh, angler. And I was like, okay, well that, like, the rivalry is going to go away, so we'll trigger the angler, summon these two from my deck. But now I can't normal summon Neptibus. But this is another case of, like, if my hand was a bit more mermail focused with, like, some Teuses or Megalos in it, I could have possibly, you know, like, played the game because I just had to keep trying to summon Neptibus over and over again, and it kept getting bounced. Whereas if I had, like, a Teus or a Megalo in my hand at any point, I could have discarded the Neptibus after it got bounced. Monster Reborn the Neptibus, and then if things happened, I could have then use the soul charge like my hand was very capable of playing through back row if at least if, if it at least starts a play going and so like the fact that there was no uh Teus or megalo in that hand just really was a a big big problem uh for the for the uh entirety of my time during that last game because he had all these back row like skill drain double impermanence uh, and the rivalry, and you can play around rivalry decently well with this form of mermails because most of what you're putting on the board is uh, sea serpents, and you can usually uh, just get access to heavy infantry. But it was still just one of those things of like, I, <laughs> I just had such a hard time. But so, this game, uh, this 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 turn structure was kind of wild. Uh, I get to drop the Moulin Glace late. Uh, I get to gumble our him with the extra link and do all that sort of stuff, and I get the sphere. I've got Call by the Grave set as well, so if he draws Ash off the top, I can Call by the Grave the Ash. Uh, but so, uh, it's just it's it's just game over from here. There's not really much you're gonna be able to do about this. I got a battle phase this turn, so um, top decking salvage is cool. I mean, I guess it's really unneeded, but since I have a battle phase, Megalo tributing the Mermaid so it can attack twice. Uh, so that means like my board has like 15,000 damage on it, regardless of whether or not he attacked with the Ibli or not. Uh, so like it. It is is one of those things that this deck just generates a lot of damage out of nowhere. That's something that the deck has always constantly done ever since Neptibus was printed. Um, and it's kind of hilarious that it still does that. But so, my opponent opens Metal Seek into Link Karibo. Uh, sets Rivalry, sets Strike. That Rivalry is a little weird because that means he's not going to be able to summon Multifaker if he flips the Rivalry early. But my hand has Teus Dragoons in it. I have to summon the Teus first. I'm not going to Moray of Greed any of the cards into my deck because uh, they're starting play cards. Like, my opponent has to, like, have it. Um, and so he's able to strike my uh, my Abyss Tius, which lets him put the uh, Multifaker on field, which means now he's capable of flipping Rivalry and just getting rid of his Link Rebo because he has two monsters on the field and he gets to choose Spellcaster rather than just being locked to Cybers. And I don't quite know why I set the Reboot and the Abyss Sphere. I think in my mind here, I was like going to pass turn and then I decided that like, wait, he only has one back row, I should probably try and force through this with the Reborn and the Teus that I have, but I just, I, 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 since I set the reboot first, like that meant the rivalry got activated and I just couldn't do anything. Um, well, like it just, it was, it was a bad time. It was a bad time for me, <laughs> 100%. Uh, one for one gets ashed. I have to reboot his, I have to reboot his uh, protocol there so that he doesn't just get to resolve Multifaker from his hand because he doesn't have Multifaker in his grave. Um, so like he can't marry an editor into that. Uh, but so that that at most buys me a turn uh, But so from here he's putting Hexy on the board because he has manifestation set and protocol set And so uh, he goes mind crush on my megalo that he just bounced to my hands But I top decked a twin twister so I chain the twin twister Hextia has nothing pointing to it uh, Or that it points to so it can't negate that so I discard pop two of his back row um, and then uh, Like the megalo is not in my hand anymore. So he has to discard a card, but unfortunately he randomly discards the Kunkuri and not the multi-faker. So if I'd been able to get like multi-faker out of his hand, then that would have been like at least decently good. But unfortunately he does still have the manifestation set that I purposefully did not target 
because I wanted the protocol gone. But even then, like, the game was very, very much out of my favor. I don't think I was ever in any position to win that one regardless. But that's only seven replays. There was supposed to be an eighth, but I forgot to save the final game from that match. <laughs> and I only realized when I went to record this video. So couldn't really get a hold of him to play another random game three. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's just the way it has to go. But, I mean, at least seven games is still a big sample size. Uh, well, not a big sample size, but it's larger than most people want to do. That's why I like doing these videos, because I would like to put out more of larger sample sizes for people to draw conclusions from, because not very many people have videos where they are playing in as competitively a format as they can at least put together. A lot of people will play against people, uh, that are just playing random decks, and they'll use that to try and, like, uh show how their deck works and it's something that I've done in the past and I could say from experience I did not like it because it just you're just like beating up on somebody that doesn't know how to play the game essentially in most of those cases and like I'd rather have people that I know that can play the game as well as I want them to play for videos to at least try and see realistically how good decks can perform against one another and I'm just using Yu-Gi-Oh Pro because the replay function on Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro is much superior than Dueling Books. Even though Dueling Book lends itself to superior gameplay, Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro has a better replay system because things are more clear, the activations are on screen for you to see, and like, I don't even really have to commentate the games directly for you to understand what's going on. Whereas with Dueling Book, like, uh, you, you kinda need somebody telling you what's going on because nothing's really activating or doing things. Uh, so the, the additional visuals are very, very much appreciated there. But anyway, I could keep rambling on into eternity, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for watching. As always, like, comment, subscribe to all the nonsense you usually do. If you're new here and want to see more awesome Yu-Gi-Oh! content, consider subscribing if you haven't already. Like this video if you want to see more videos done in this format, and make some suggestions of decks you'd like to see me do this thing with in the comments down below. But other than that, if you want to see some of my streams that I do regularly, or at least semi-regularly, like two to three times a week, you can go over to the Twitch link that is in the description of this video and give my Twitch channel a follow to be notified the next time I go live. I usually post videos here to announce the streams as well, but I also definitely announce when I'm going live in my personal Discord server for the channel, which a link to that is also in the description of this video if you're interested in coming and chatting, maybe getting some deck help, or just talking about some whatever random bullshit you want. But other than that, as I've already said, thanks for watching, thanks for your time as usual, guys, and take care. I'll see you in the next video.